Okay. Good. We have everybody here tonight. Okay, well, welcome. I'm Mayor Val Vandenberg, and I'd like to call the March 22nd, 2021 regular council meeting to order and begin by acknowledging that the land on which we are gathered today for this meeting is the tradi traditional unceded territory of the KC Kwantlen, Maswi, and Semiamu First Nations. And for any members of the public attendance in attendance to watch these proceedings today, welcome. Just a reminder to keep your mics and your camera turned off while you are in attendance. So I'll introduce everybody else on this meeting today. Uh, we have Councillor Paul Albrecht, Councillor Terry James, Councillor Gail Martin, Councillor Nathan Fahal, Councillor Rudy Stortaboom, and Councillor Rosemary Wallace. And for staff today, we have Francis Chung, our Chief Administrative Officer, Darren Light, our Director of Corporate Services, Carl Johansson, our Director of Development Services, Rick Baumhoff, our Director of Engineering Parks and Environment, Kim Hilton, our Director of Recreation, Culture and Community Services, and Kelly Kenny, our Corporate Officer. And I believe from engineering, we also have a higher uh, higher here today as well. I hope I haven't forgotten anyone. All right, so adoption of the March 22nd, 2020 rent regular agenda, that the March 22nd, 2021 agenda be adopted as circulated. Any changes or additions? Councillor Albrecht. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I would like to uh, add at the end of correspondence the letter from uh, Mayor George Harvey from Delta. Yep. Thank you. Okay, can we get a motion a seconder on that? All those in favor to add that in? Okay. Uh, sorry, let me just add it to my, while well, I'm here. Make notes, otherwise I forget by the time we get there. It's a little different when you're on Zoom because everybody has to wait for you. Okay, so that the March 8th, 2020 agenda with amendment be adopted as circulated. All those in favor, that carries. Beautiful adoption of the minutes, regular meeting minutes from March 8th, 2021. That the minutes of the regular meeting held on March 8, 2021 be adopted as circulated. Any corrections? Councillor Martin? Just moving it. Okay, a seconder on that. Councillor Wallace, any corrections? Seeing none, all those in favor? That carries. Special pre-closed meeting minutes from March 1st, 2021, that the minutes of the special pre-closed meeting held on March 1st, 2021 be adopted as circulated. I need a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Stortaboom, Councillor James, any corrections? Seeing none, all those in favor? And that carries. All right, so first up this afternoon, we have a community spotlight with Jane Nelson, who's the Executive Director of Langley Animal Protection Society, LAPS. Welcome, Jane. Thank you. Having me. <laughs> um, I will uh, see if I can share my screen. Um, sorry, I should be, but I had this all set up. Um, all right, so that's can you all see that? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. 
Okay, um, sorry about that. Um, Zoom is not my uh, expertise, area of expertise. Um, furry little four-legged creatures are. Um, LAPS was established in 2003 by a dedicated group of volunteers eager to see a positive change in the way uh, animals were cared for in our community. And uh, a lovely group of five women led by the amazing Patty Dale got together and uh, started a little organization called LAPS and we were born uh, in 2003. And um, we first contracted with the city of Langley in January, on January 1st, 2004, and have been working uh, together ever since. In uh, 2009, LAPS had a 10,000 square foot state-of-the-art shelter facility built, um, fulfilling Patty Dale's dream, um, which sadly she did not get to see uh, built. Um, and in 2018, LAPS increased its capacity to care uh, by building a brand new uh, cat intake and isolation facility that we dubbed the ISOASIS, uh, with some help from the city, thank you very much. And the services that we provide um, are animal control services. And uh, our role there primarily is to promote public safety through um, relating to animals through education and enforcement. And the kinds of services that we provide are things like um, responding to calls for dogs and livestock at large, uh, reuniting lost animals with their people, that's cats and dogs uh, and livestock sometimes, uh, investigating dog bites, um, doing the uh, conducting our annual license campaign, and uh, supporting emergency services that's fire, police, and ambulance uh, 24 hours a day uh, where animals are involved. And of course, because of the kind of work we do, we often have uh, many animals uh, who need our help um, to find new homes dogs, cats, kittens, um, and the occasional pot belly pig. We have a little pig right now named Bebop that is in need of a home. Um, we also uh, recognize that there's about 22,000 unowned cats living in the Langleys. And uh, we have a commitment to try to reduce that, um, address that cat overpopulation crisis and reduce the population. And one of the ways that we do that is through our TNR programs, which are largely um, volunteer run, which is amazing for us. And um, we've actually just received a large grant um, to help us with, um, our community cat work. And uh, it really is gonna take the whole community working together to get this uh, population under control. Um, in addition to uh, those services, we also provide community outreach. And I think this is some of the most important work that we do, especially since COVID-19 uh, came about. Um, and through our Majors Legacy Fund, we're able to provide support to the community and again, our commitment there is to ensure that animals aren't coming into the shelter for um, because people can't afford to care for them. So, you know, if we can support them with food, with veterinary care um, or other basic necessities, we do that so we can keep them together um, in the community. Um, we run a boarding and training facility um, inside. It's a very unique partnership with uh, Corrections Canada. Um, we have an, a, an employment training program for the women incarcerated at the Fraser Valley Institution, which is a federal prison for women in Abbotsford. And um, it's a social enterprise for us. So we run a full service boarding and training uh, and daycare facility there. And we generate enough income to pay for the program and also to help us run our very unique adoption programs that we run in shelter, which is very cool. When you're small, you know, you got to be uh, creative in how you fund things. And, uh, and then of course, uh, one of the most amazing things uh, that um, we have is our volunteers. So we provide lots of amazing volunteer opportunities um, and, uh, and, and of course the animals and, uh, and the staff uh, deeply benefit from that. Uh, COVID-19, wow, I'm unlike, uh, I'm sure just like everyone else, uh, we were hugely impacted by COVID and um, you know, we're sort of slowly starting to reopen and get back to some uh, normalcy now, but, um, you know, it was, uh, it was very uh, crazy for us when it first happened. Of course, we closed our doors for the very first time in our history to the general public and to our um, very beloved volunteers. Um, you know, and as an essential service, we really had to work um, quickly to try and develop um, protocols that would uh, keep the public and our 
partners and our staff safe and uh, as we prepared for the possibility that we would be intaking animals from COVID positive homes and you know trying to sort of fathom how many that would be and 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 how we would do that safely you know the science was changing all the time uh, the information that was coming out so it was um it was it was really crazy um and uh, we had uh yeah, we had lots, lots of adjustments to make, just like everyone else. Um, the pandemic uh, definitely forced small, small organizations like ours to be creative and innovate contactless ways to continue to do our work. And um, it accelerated some processes for us. And uh, we managed to uh, move all of our adoption stuff, um, application process online and that sort of thing, um, develop lots of contactless uh, processes. So. Um, I think a lot of those will actually hang on to uh, once uh, things open up again. We are um, back open to the public uh, again and uh, have ramped up our volunteer programs again uh, now. So that's been awesome. And of course the world may have changed with COVID but our mission has definitely not changed. Um, we knew that this would be an important time for animals and, and that animals and people would need our help more than ever. Uh, we worked on developing new community partnerships um, so that we were able to help get services to those in need. Um, some crazy things that we would never have thought of um, happened. We were absolutely overwhelmed by the number of applicants for every adoptable animal. It was just, we actually had to change our process and set, set quite strict limits on how many applications we would accept. Um, I think we received something like 190 applications for one litter of kittens um, at the beginning, uh, sort of when COVID had sort of first started get, getting, sorry, had first hit. Um, and I mean, it's a great problem to have, but it's still a big challenge for staff, a small staff to get through that number of applications uh, for every adoptable animal. And then the other really weird unexpected um, challenge that we were faced with was of course when COVID first happened, um, all the PPE was um, meant to be saved for human healthcare services, which totally made sense, but that meant that our veterinary partners had to cancel any non-essential um, um, surgeries or, or procedures, uh, and there, we literally could not spay or neuter any animals um, for months, and, uh, and since all of the um, numbers of animals that have been adopted, our clinics are just slammed with um, pressure to provide services. And so it's made it very difficult for us uh, to get in um, in a really timely way. So we've developed, um, fortunately, we've got some great uh, veterinary partners who have um, come to our rescue and, uh, and, and it's, it's all working out swimmingly, but um, it was very, it, it, it's been one of the unexpected challenges for sure. And then a major legacy fund, um, of course, has been really front and center um, during the COVID um, challenges. And um, it's amazing. This is one of the funds I think that I am most proud of. And, um, and I think it's, again, some of the most important work that we do. And, and really it was funded to be able to keep people and their pets together, especially during challenging times like the ones that we faced over the last year. Um, the fund provides financial assistance to members of the community who love their, their pets, but may be facing hardships and have been un, un, unable to provide the care that they need. We supported more than 600 families uh, last year um, so, that we, so that we could keep them together in the community. And, and the uh, components of that Majors Legacy Fund are veterinary care. Last year, we provided um, $31,000 in free vet care to more than 230 families to ensure their pets receive necessary medical treatments. Um, and some of those animals literally would have died uh, on, on the day uh, that we were contacted had we not been able to fund those surgeries. And again, I wanna just um, thank the city of Langley for um, supporting this uh, very important fund um, because it really has, uh, um, especially last year, um, you know, there was a lot of need uh, for sure in the community. And, um, there's, we also provided cat compassionate boarding through that fund, more than 300 days uh, last year of compassionate boarding to families in crisis. That includes um, people fleeing domestic abuse, um, seniors, for example, that need to be hospitalized but uh, don't have any family or friends to care for their pets, 
and uh, how tragic uh, that would be if they if they had to surrender them to a shelter well, um, because they were in hospital for a short amount of time. Um, and of course, other uh, families that have experienced hardship in other ways. Um, last year, there were, um, I think, two uh, apartment fires that we were um, called out to provide support for, and we were able to support the families that had lost um, their apartments, their homes in, in those fires. So that was a really amazing experience to be able to step up and, and provide um, boarding where we needed to, but also being able to pr provide supplies um, because they lost literally everything. Um, our pet food bank, our pet pantry, we supported uh, 400 families with almost 10,000 pounds of food last year um, and provided other basic necessities like leashes, collars, pet beds, jackets, that sort of thing. And, um, and we, we definitely um, partnered with um, other, other organizations in the community. Um, last year, we actually established some new relationships with um, organizations like the John Howard Society, who were trying to get uh, food and care, um, basic necessities out to um, members, of the, uh, sorry, members of the public that they support um, in Langley and uh, also stepping up our aid to existing partners like Kim's Angels and uh, Gateway of Hope. Um, this expanded our reach and uh, definitely increased our community partners capacity as well so that uh, together we could get uh, pet food and supplies to the people in need. And um, the requirements, especially during COVID, we really reduced and um, we did get some additional funding um, for to help people who'd been specifically impacted by COVID-19. So um, typically uh, people have to provide a proof of income um, in order to qualify for the fund. But um, with our additional funding and with COVID um, hitting everyone so hard, we really just ask that people um, be able to demonstrate that they were impacted by COVID-19 and uh, they were able to qualify with uh, very little barriers for the funding. Well, actually no barrier. Um, we, um, in order to sorry, qualify for the fund, you also have to be a resident of the city or township of Langley. Um, we have a $1,000 limit-ish uh, that we um, will fund people for. And if, uh, if it's a really significant surgery, um, there's a couple of other organizations who help out provincially, so we'll connect people to those and we can combine those, um, those granting agencies to uh, be able to provide a higher amount of uh, dollar amount. And then, of course, if the animal is not spayed or neutered, we cover the additional cost of that just to ensure that that gets done. And uh, that is it. Cute little um, one of my little foster kittens, pancakes. And uh, that's the end. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Well, thank you so much for all you and your organization do. You know, families really are, or animals really are a part of our, typically part of our families. So, um, you know, it's very important and COVID has been very hard. So thank you for going that extra mile um, to keep families with their pets. I truly appreciate it. Thank you. Um, thank I have counselor. Yes, thanks, Jane. Um, Councillor Pahal, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and through you. Uh, I just have a question. Did I hear you right that it was 20,000 um, feral cats in Langley? Yes. Okay. It's crazy. So yeah. um, how, how have other communities addressed this sort of situation, maybe in Canada or throughout the world? Yeah, Humane Canada um, is uh, has done some really important um, studies. Uh, they've done two. They did a follow up study um, 2018, I think, um, to follow the first study they did in uh, in 2013. Oh, sorry, I might have my dates wrong there, but they did a study in I think 2013, and then they did another study five years later to follow up on it and and looking at just what what the solutions are and what everyone's doing and. Um, TNR is as recognized as one of the most important things that we can do um, as a community. So that's um, a trap, neuter, and return to field. So for those feral wild cats, um, really getting them, we trap them and we provide uh, spay neuter surgeries. We do some ear tipping so we know that they've been done. It's easy to recognize which ones have been done. And then we vaccinate them and then we re-release re them back to their homes. Um, about 25% of owned cats are still not spayed and neutered. So we give 
uh, away 240 free spay and neuter certificates every year to help um, reduce those, those financial barriers in helping people uh, get their cats spayed and neutered. Um, and then of course, um, our shelter, though we're not contracted to provide um, necessarily um, specific cat services, there's just such a need in the community that that's something that we've always done. So we take in close to 400 cats and about 325 or so of those are um, kittens that are really coming in off the street. So we take as many as we can fit um, and then we spay and neuter them all and find homes for them. Uh, so it's kind of a thread pronged approach. And if I have to just have two follow up questions. So who who funds the TNR program right now? Is that self funded? Yeah, we we all of the work that we do with cats um, is is pretty much funded by donors. And, oh, are, and grants and grants. <laughs> and, and to meet your goals for the cat challenge in Langley, is that funding sufficient? Uh, I mean, everyone always needs more money. I know that, but are you yeah. finding you're making the impact you're hoping to make? We've just been so lucky and we've just received um, a, a nice grant to um, help us um, address the community cat uh, population. So we're hoping through education and talking to people and um, promoting, helping to promote, we wanna be able to first identify where all the cats are and, um, and then come next year, um, so we'll be able to create a bit more of a plan in terms of how we're going to develop it. So I think we're good for this year, but next year, I suspect we're going to be in need of more funding to be able to really um, tackle those, um, those, those properties where we identify there are large populations. Yeah, I, I, I know that's important, I think, just because of the impact they can have with wildlife and, and stuff like that. So and killing songbirds in places like the floodplain in Langley City, right? So Absolutely. Uh, my, my final question is, and someone once said that this was the third rail of local government politics is like, I think some municipalities that you may be contracted with are considering a cat license. Is that something that's been shown as effective in other communities? And what, what value does that bring? Yeah, um, it does. I mean, humane, um, sorry, the Humane Society of Calgary was one of the first big organizations that did cat licensing. And um, they've been hugely successful in adapting uh, bylaws and um, in their cat licensing program. It took about three years. I think they did, um, you know, first with education and you know, sort of promoting it. And then they gave free licenses. And then sort of in the third year, they started doing the licensing. And they found that um, it's really helped to control the population in a big way. Um, it really reduces the nuisance behaviors as well that go along with having cats that are indoor outdoor, even even owned indoor outdoor cats. Um, and and basically the, the licensing has funded um, all of those programs. So I think they have found it very successful. Um, there's no one in BC really doing it in a big way yet. Oh, I don't think anyone in BC is actually licensing. I think the first step is to start looking at maybe creating some bylaws. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Great questions. Anyone else? Councilor Storderboom. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And then thank you, uh, Councilor Hall, for asking a lot of those questions that I was wondering about. So uh, uh, I just wanted to thank you, Jane, for your presentation, for the good work that you do, and ask about um, the dog walking program during this pandemic. I can't help but think that with so many applications for people wanting to adopt, uh, you might not have a lot of pets uh, there that need to be walked, but uh, if uh, that is the case, uh, maybe now would be a good time to identify uh, what criteria um, volunteers would be uh, required to follow in the event that the walking program is still up and running. And can you just expand on that? Yeah, absolutely. We have um, started up our volunteer program again, and you you are 100% right. We don't have a lot of animals right now because they just get snapped up so quickly. Um, but we do still have some dogs that are, um, we've had uh, quite a few surrenders uh, recently. So we do have um, definitely some dogs that are in need of walking. We have a pretty cool app um, uh, related to COVID-19 to help people keep people safe. And we've got some great um, COVID uh, protocols in place to keep everyone safe. So um, definitely, 
if you're interested in dog walking, you can definitely come by the shelter. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're doing a new intake for volunteers in uh, April coming up. So we're excited. Wonderful. Thank you. I think there'll be a lot of people who uh, uh, would like to be out walking uh, a nice dog on a sunny day like today. Can you just uh, answer one other quick question, if you would be so kind? The significant difference between the SPCA and LAPS. Um, mm. I understand the SPCA is a, a much bigger organization, and that LAPS is a community organization. Do you basically have the same mandate, or is it a bit different? Um, that's an excellent uh, question. Um, the the BCSPCA, I always try to, to make it really um, a very simple answer. The BCSPCA typically protects animals from um, sorry, people. Sorry, the BCSPCA protects animals from people. And um, LAPS, though we also protect animals, um, we really, our, our mandate is to protect uh, people from animals if that makes sense. <laughs> um, so we're really about public safety. And um, although we do have um, an amazing facility and we do have a lot of amazing programs and do a lot of the same work as the SPCA, um, ultimately the SPCA is um, the provincial authority in terms of welfare. Excellent, thank you very much. Just one more question, if I may. Uh, who do I call if I have a coyote in the backyard? Is that you or Criticare? Um, that would probably be wildlife conservation. Okay. If, um, yeah, if there, if there's, especially if there's uh, reports of injured um, wildlife or if there's uh, wildlife that are sort of posing a risk to public safety, it's uh, conservation. Thank you very much, Jane. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Okay, anybody else have any questions for Jane? I don't see any. Well, thank you very much for coming this afternoon and presenting. Uh, again, we really, really appreciate everything you're doing. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. And uh, thank you uh, uh, all for um, your guys' amazing support. We really appreciate it. Wonderful. Have a great afternoon. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Uh, the next into mayor's report the next upcoming meetings regular council meeting is april 12 2021 and the following regular council meeting after that is april 26 2021 and we have a recreation update with uh, kim hilton our director of recreation culture and community services thank you your worship and members of council let's hope this goes smoothly today uh, from the beginning and clicking on here you see the full screen? We do not. You don't see the full screen. That is correct. Do not see the full screen. <laughs> um, okay, let's go here again. And there we go. Now you should. Yes. Fantastic, thank you. So this is our update for March, 2021 from Recreation, Culture and Community Services. I'm happy to say that we are promoting Pitch In as a month this year, April 1st to the 30th. People can sign up uh, by calling Tim's Community Center at 604-514-2940 uh, to register and participate. Uh, we are encouraging people to get out, exercise, become familiar with your community and in doing so you can also help clean up some of the litter and the garbage that you might see on the streets, parks or trails. All participants will be entered to win a $50 downtown dollars. Uh, so again, we're encouraging people to come to the downtown area to do some shopping as well. So you can register online through our ActiveNet. You can register over the phone, as I mentioned earlier, or you can come to Tim's Community Center in person and register. Supplies will be picked up at Tim's Community Center and details will be given when people register. So that's pitch in month, April 1st to 30th. <clears throat> Happy to say that once again, we are bringing the healthy living bags back. Fortunately, they continue to be a dollar, uh, $5 per bag. Um, and you can anticipate two to three more times more product than you would uh, be if you purchased in the store. 
This is in partnership with Langley Meals on Wheels, and we're so excited to be partnering again with them. Our first date is April the 6th, and I have to say, um, in less than a week, we have over 56 people signed up already, and uh, so that's really good news. People were um, happy to have this, this uh, program come back. Again, people can um, register online or over the phone at 604-514-2940. Um, and these orders do need to be purchased uh, the Wednesday prior to delivery day. So Wednesday this week is our final day to purchase for April. Pickup will be at Tim's Community Center on the first Tuesday of the month between 11 a.m. and 8 p.m. Healthy Living Bag. Canadian Film Day, April 21st. Once again, we're able to offer this, but it's virtual. So uh, you can find out more information about our Canadian Film Day. You can join different watch parties. There will be a list of options on the city webpage and you can pick your, your own film to watch using a streaming service of your choice. So how do you get more information? Just look at our Langley events page at langleycity.ca. Chair yoga. We have another session starting on next Monday from 2 to 3 uh, here at Tim's Community Center. It's $28 for four sessions. And to register, you can phone 604-514-2940. We also have Fit for Life starting on Tuesday. It's a morning, mid-morning class here at Tim's Community Center. Uh, it's 10 sessions for $50. And again, to register, 604-514-2940. Gentle Yoga. This is running Mondays, uh, 3.30 to 4.30 here at Tim's. And again, um, it starts next week and you can phone to register. Tai Chi. Uh, it's been a while since we've had Tai Chi, uh, since the pandemic, pre-pandemic, but we're offering it Wednesday, starting April the 14th from 7 to 8 p.m. Uh, it's uh, $150 for 10 sessions, and uh, for more information, you can phone 604-514-2940. Our youth programs, so our youth programs are picking up in, in um, popularity, particularly the basketball is, is a lot of fun and open gym. Uh, we also have youth night, and again, we're seeing some more um, uptake with that. So we've actually split youth night into two different time frames, so we can accommodate all the youth that are dropping in. We have other programs such as teen time and youth lounge. We also have some uh, registered programs coming up, some financial literacy and volleyball. So if you're interested, please check out our website at langleycity.ca under the youth page or you can phone 604-514-2940. It's nice to see youth back into our games room and gymnasium. Our first set of active sports, active start sports was uh, sold out. Uh, so we're offering another set again. This is for ages two to five. We have floor hockey and soccer. Um, this is parent participation. You can register online or you can phone 604 514-2940. This is keeping the kids active and developing some skills while having fun. And new again um, since last year is the ABC's one, two, threes. And this is really for ages two to three. It's targeted to kids who aren't quite ready for preschool yet, but it'll get them prepped for preschool. They'll work with colors and numbers and letters and shapes, having lots of fun. Uh, the, Next session starts on uh, April the 7th, which is a Wednesday, and that's at Douglas Recreation Center with our amazing uh, ECE staff over there, and it's from 10 to 11 a.m. For more information, you can phone 604-514-2940 or check our website out at langleycity.ca. And a parent and taught drop-in, which we now call Roaming Rascals, that's for ages 0 to 5. We are offering it Tuesdays and Thursdays. We've divided this into two sessions as well because it has been very popular in the past. It's $5 per child and you do have to register in advance. So 604-514-2940. Fundamental sports. This is an age up, up from the last group that we spoke about. Uh, so we have our basketball and soccer and that uh, is running uh, in April, first week of April, so if you're interested, it's for ages 6 to 12, 
and you can phone Tim's Community Centre or Douglas Recreation Centre, uh, 604-514-2940. We all know this number by the end of my presentation, I think. And that's it. Any questions? Thank you for your presentation and thank you for staff and all the things you guys are doing. Roaming rascals, I love it. That sounds that sounds like so much fun. You just need to add nap time in there and I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any questions or comments for Kim Hilton? Councillor Sturdeboom. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and, and thank you, Ms. Hilton, for your excellent report on all of the good work that you're doing. Um, I appreciate that this has been especially challenging, uh, but uh, that uh, we are looking forward to opening up all of our programs. And uh, you, you've really led the way, I think, for a lot of municipalities to see how well um, you've been able to adapt with your team. Uh, forgive me if I sound like a broken record, but I know that that walking track is really, really popular. Um, is there any indication that that may be opening up for the public anytime soon? Uh, we will be discussing this as a, a group. Um, I, I believe this is not going to be a vaccination site. So that's what we were waiting to find out um, if we're going to have to close things down again. So hopefully uh, within the next week or so, we'll have some set dates for opening. Thank you very much. And we'll be looking to the province to identify um, if people uh, are able to attend uh, something like the walking track, uh, even though they may not be vaccinated. I know the numbers are up again today. I'm, I'm suspecting that it may be uh, vaccinations would be required for that. Uh, not, at this, not at this point, but um, uh, we will have COVID safety protocols in place and limited numbers using the track at one time. As always, excellent job. Thank you very much for your report. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Okay, I don't see anyone else. So thank you very much for that. All right, uh, up next we have Councillor Albrecht with Discover Langley City. Did you actually, did you have a presentation or are we just receiving that information? <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, the, the reports in the, in the package and, and uh, with COVID, it's, there's a lot of behind the scenes planning and organizing. So I was just gonna say, we'll receive the report. If anyone's got any questions, I'm happy to answer them, but that's what I would like to do. Thank you. So um, I need a seconder on that. Uh, it was kind of a tie between Councillor Bahal and Councillor Wallace, but I'll, I'll give it to Councillor Wallace because she's looking at me like she wants this one. So um, any uh, further comments on it or Councillor Stortepin? Yeah, thank you for your very concise uh, report, <laughs> Councillor Albrecht. Um, I, I appreciate the work that you do with uh, that group and the, the work that they do for our community. So uh, please let me uh, just take the opportunity to uh, thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, our Councillor Stortaboom, and I'll pass that along. Councillor Wallace. Yeah, just uh, lots of great things happening. So usually Councillor Albrecht um, gives his presentation or his report and the rest of the community can hear it or there's just some reporting out. So I'm just wondering why, when something's in our agenda and we read it as council, when, how, how far does it get out to the rest of, of the public? Yeah, uh, good question. It's, uh, it's usually there's a report like this is connected to, uh, I believe our website there, of course, Discover Langley City has their own website. And uh, like, a, I, I guess, it seems like the last few reports seem somewhat repetitive and um, more st statistics driven because of uh, COVID. We're doing more uh, like say social media or um, uh, videos or, or off, like kind of online type uh, things. So uh, uh, there's nothing really earth shattering in this report. Um, we're continuing along and, and you know, you're, they're kind of doing these plans, layers of plans, plan A, plan B, plan C, depending on how things are going to evolve as time moves. So 
Uh, yeah, there was nothing really outstanding to report on this one. So I just thought I would uh, be conscious of our time and, and uh, just say we'll receive it and, and get it out there to the public. Perfect. Thank you. Just work getting done. Everybody's doing their job. <laughs> okay. Any other comments or questions? Uh, seeing none, I'm going to lower Rudy's hand because I think that was up from before. And all those in favor of receiving it for information, good to go. Okay, now on to bylaws. Uh, bylaw 3152, Watercourse Protection Bylaw, final reading of a bylaw to protect watercourses in the city of Langley, that the city or that the bylaw cited as the Watercourse Protection Bylaw 2021, number 3152, be read a final time. I need a mover and a seconder on that. Councillor Stortaboom, Councillor James, any discussion? Councillor Albrecht? Uh, thank, thank you, Madam Mayor. And I just, I just really wanted to reinforce, uh, like what I said at the last meeting. Um, I think the fines uh, should be improved, but this is an important step that we need to take in the community. We can always make these adjustments later on, and there are probably some other things uh, in the document that will change over time or as we implement uh, the and monitor uh, development in the community. So. Um, uh, unfortunately, with bylaws, the nature of bylaws, it will have to come back to council if we do any revisions or changes. So uh, I think this is a really proactive measure that's been long overdue. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm supportive of it. So I just wanted to, uh, again, voice my, my opinions and, and uh, support. Thank you. Great, thanks. Councillor Stratton. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and, and thank you, Councillor Albrecht, for your perspective. I can appreciate that uh, $500 is just a, a drop in the bucket for a developer uh, when uh, looking at the, the business model of uh, a new multifamily residential development. Uh, may I ask that we maybe come back to it a year from now and see how many incidents have been recorded where these fines have been levied and maybe move from that point forward in determining whether or not we want to increase those fines. Yeah. Good afternoon. If I may uh, just go ahead, please. please respond. I just didn't know the, the final level that currently right now is proposing this bylaw. Uh, mainly is in line with neighboring municipalities. Having said that, if in the future we feel that it's not going to enforce to a level that we would like to see. You always have this uh, opportunity to come back uh, and change them. Uh, we have other means uh, in the current bylaw. One is just to take them to court, stopping the work. You know, by uh, the uh, Community Charter and Offense Act, the maximum level is about $10,000 that we can use that if uh, they refuse to uh, comply or stop the, the harming the water bodies. So there are other avenues that we can work uh, with. But at this stage, uh, staff felt that being in line with other municipalities may be a safer and better approach. Uh, like I said, we can always change it in the future if we found out that this is not as efficient as we would like to see. Great, thank you, Mr. Gill. Thank you, Mr. Gill. Does Mr. Chung have something to add? Um, through the mayor to Council Stortoum, yes, I think, you know, with respect to fees and fines and things like that, I think it's always good to monitor the situation and see uh, how we're doing with the implementation of those uh, bylaws and, and the fines. I think it would be appropriate for staff to come back, say, in six months or a year time to give an update to council and see if there is a need to adjust the fees or the fines at that time. So I think that's a great idea. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Okay, Councillor Bahal. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And I definitely hear the conversation about fines and how they are, but I think for a developer, even a $10,000 fine isn't that much. Uh, but what I think is important in this bylaw, which I'm support, which is why I'm supporting it as it is right now, 
knowing that we can go back is that it's really about that reporting and that submission regularly to the city. And if there is an issue, the independent uh, expert, which I believe that if they lie or if they fudge numbers, they could lose their professional accreditation. And uh, I guess I would ask to the mayor to Mr. Gill, is that correct? If they lie or fudge numbers, they could be in serious problems? Uh, I suppose so. I don't know that for a fact that uh, QEPs, what consequences are uh, uh, out there if they don't act professionally. I suppose that like any other certifications on designations, if you don't comply with the regulations, you're gonna use your designation. So yeah, I, I don't have any reason to believe otherwise. So my short answer would be yes. Yeah, so with, with that, I think the most effective tool for us is that we have that, that it's reported right away. And that if we do see an issue, we issue a stop work order immediately and move to rectify. Uh, yep. Because that's something we can do now where a fine you can issue, but then it can take months or even a year to try to collect. So I would hope that we go towards a proactive approach with the monitoring and responding right away. And I'm hopeful that we have enough staff resources able to do that. So I don't know if Mr. Gill or Mr. Chung could respond to, do we actually have the internal capacity to be able to when we see something like this respond in the prompt time. Um, through, to, uh, through the mayor, through Councillor Paul, I think we do have the inspector on board to undertake those uh, inspections. And to address uh, what you mentioned about, you know, uh, how do we notify the profession? I think, you know, obviously if there is a uh, infraction and if the qualified professional are not doing what they need to do, there are means where we can report those incidents to the, the profession themselves. And then the profession will have to undertake an investigation to see if there is any misconduct on the professional on their part. And we normally leave it up to the profession to decide uh, what kind of penalties, if any, uh, to impose on that professional who may be uh, doing something that's not they're supposed to do. Thank you. Thank you. And just one follow up. I was a uh, applied, uh, I was a uh, through the applied technicians of DC uh, as a certified technician with them. I know that if you um, misreported information, you could lose your designation. So they, I remember as a member of a professional board, they took those things quite seriously. And I know we had to, at least in the electronics profession, we had to swear an oath, basically. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Madam Mayor. If, can I add something before we <laughs> change, yeah. change the subject, if I may? Uh, two things I would like to add, if I may. One is that so far in the past, what we have seen is that it is the QEPs that are or were coming to the city asking for uh, uh, some, com some more requirements to op open their hands to, uh, to uh, cooperate better with the city. And they were just saying that with the older wildlife that we had, they had some restrictions in reporting because the VALA was not requiring. And that was one of the reasons that triggered this VALA update. So in that sense, the past history is telling us that QEPs are cooperating well. Uh, another thing I just want to add uh, with regards to hold them accountable, we are working in, uh, on another bylaw by and design standards that the, the council will be uh, introduced shortly. And in that there is a form that uh, prior to uh, uh, starting any uh, construction, the QEP and the co contractor, ha they have to sign that. In that uh, form, it mentions that if some violations happens and the QEP doesn't record or report it to the city, not only the QEP itself, but also their firm will be held uh, accountable. So there are also some pushes from other angle that is coming soon, yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, I don't see anybody else. We'll call the vote. All those in favor and opposed, that carries. Okay, bylaw 3156, Municipal Ticket Information System Bylaw Amendment, final reading of a bylaw to amend the Municipal Ticket Information Bylaw. Um, 
it increases the fines for the new water course protection bylaw, which we just did. So the motion is that the bylaw cited as the Municipal Ticket Information System Bylaw 2011, number 2846, amendment number 16, 2021, number 3156, be read a final time. I need a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Stortaboom, Councillor James, any discussion on that? I think we've had a lot already. So I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. And bylaw 3157, fees and charges amendment bylaw, final reading of a bylaw to amend the fees and charges bylaw to add a fee for reinspecting a site after violation of water course protection bylaw um, has occurred. And that the, okay, so the motion is that the bylaw cited as the fees and charges bylaw 2010 bylaw number 2837, amendment number 28. 2021 number 3157 be read uh, a final time. So any mover and a seconder, store boom and all. Any further discussion? I think we're good. All those in favor, any opposed? That by law carries. Okay, on to committee reports. Um, we have a report, I believe, environmental task group re recommendations from the March 11, 2021 meeting. And I believe, Councillor Wallace, you'd like to present some recommendations. Yes, thank you. And it is in our, the summary is in the report. And I don't know if you wanted me to read the summary as well as the committee recommendation. Uh, that to, is up to you. If you'd like to provide a summary, you're more than welcome to. Okay. So uh, at our March 15th uh, meeting, um, committee re recommendation that council directs staff to investigate installing a user pay electric vehicle charging station at City Hall and other civic facilities that is accessible 24 hours a day to the public. And the second uh, recommendation that council requests staff to include a budget in 2022 to retain a consultant to complete a streetscape and park waste audit and provide options to improve waste diversion. Um, so the summary, the following are excerpts from the March 11th, 2021 environmental task group meeting in which motions were made regarding EV charging stations and streetscape garbage recycling receptacles. So the existing EV charging station in the city hall parkade is accessible due to, oh, sorry, is inaccessible due to COVID restrictions and is further restricted in non-COVID times when Tim's community center is closed. There was a consensus on the task group that the city should consider adding additional 24 seven EV stations in various locations on city property. Staff noted that there are no plans at this time to put another charging station at city hall or other city facilities. An issue surrounding supplying these stations is that it will, it will the Langley cities, it will be on the Langley city taxpayers who would be subsidizing the cost of installation, maintenance, and power to these vehicles. A question was asked if it would be possible for this city to charge a fee for the charging via credit card. It was noted that BC Hydro and senior governments offers rebates for charging station installation costs. After further discussion, it was suggested that uh, the task group ask council to direct staff to look into installing EV charging stations in various locations throughout the city and on city property that would be accessible 24 hours a day. It was moved and it was seconded that council direct staff to investigate installing a user pay EV charging station at city hall and other facilities that is accessible 24 hours a day to the public and that was carried. So onto the streetscape receptacles, staff provided a PowerPoint presentation highlighting the following. City has a contract with Creative Outdoor which supplies streetscape recy recycling and waste receptacles in exchange for adver advertising rights. The contract term is 2016 to 2026 with a six month notice for termination with possible pay out costs for amortized costs of receptacles for remaining years in contract. There are, are 71 street receptacles provided by Creative Outdoor. The contamination rate is very high and therefore all three streams are disposed of in the landfill as garbage. The city collection system consists of a single operator collection 
packer truck, which collects all material from creative outdoor receptacles, as well as other city garbage receptacles on city streets, in parks, and in trails. To improve waste diversion, it would be necessary to review the following receptacle design and signage to clearly identify the acceptable materials that go into um, slot opening. If Creative Outdoor would work with the city to implement a new receptacle design, or if there would be a cost to terminate the agreement, determine waste contamination rates and our reasonable expectations to be able to reduce contamination by changing the receptacle signage. Cost to supply new streetscape receptacles and implement um, new multi-stream collection system. Total streetscape water recycling weights and potential cost savings to divert materials from waste stream landfill. Upon further discussion, there was general agreement that a better job in streetscape waste diversion needs to be made. A few other comments, questions, and suggestions for the city consideration were, could city existing receptacles be added to, the, to accept dog waste? Could a pilot project be done for dog waste at a couple of the parts in the city to gauge public response? Could city take out advertising on receptacles to educate the public about separating garbage and recycling streams? It was moved and seconded that counts request staff to include a budget in 2022 to retain a consultant to complete a streetscape and park waste audit and prove options to improve waste diversion. Thank you. Okay, so there's two motions here. The first motion, I'm going to read it again, and then uh, we'll have a discussion on that, and then we'll move to the second motion. So the first motion is that council directs staff to investigate installing a user pay EV electric vehicle charging station at City Hall and other civic facilities that is accessible 24 hours a day to the public. So, um, okay, so Rosemary put that forward. Um, Councillor Albrecht seconded it. Um, so discussion on that. Councillor Storderboom, you have your hand up and then Councillor Albrecht after. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. And, you know, just for the record, I think I see three motions here, but uh, we'll leave that uh, doggy do where it is for right now. <laughs> um, with regard to the EV charging, I, I think it's a great idea. We need more of those. I think that that's the way that the marketplace is going. And uh, user pay um, is a good idea too. Um, my question is really around the EV charging that we already have in place and how that is being billed to the end user. I'm hoping that staff can identify that, uh, you know, uh, there is a billing process uh, in place, uh, how that is done, and if this will be the same type of billing process as being recommended by uh, Councilor Wallace's report. Re respond please um yes the, the, right, currently there we are not charging for the use of the chargers and in fact um those charges would need to be updated and uh, um, i think even up to being replaced because they're out outdated and need to be have the new technology to enable billing so that's the purpose of doing this investigation, just determine what the total cost would be if we wanted to convert the ones that are in the underground garage, as well as uh, if we wanted to install new ones in the upper park, outside parking lot, and possibly at other, other civic facilities. Thank you, Mr. Baumhoff. Uh, I can appreciate that the charging stations in the underground parking garage for the city hall haven't been available to the general public for a year. So um, the idea of um, having charging stations that are more accessible to the general public uh, is something uh, I will support. Uh, and uh, in keeping with your comments, Mr. Bahamov, uh, I would also uh, like to see updating of the charging stations that we do have so that the billing is um, uh, the same for all. Uh, continuity, I think is uh, uh, very important. And uh, I think that the, the free trial period may have expired. So uh, that's my recommendation, but uh, I do support this resolution. Thank you again for your comments. Thank you, Madam Mayor. That's all, Frank. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. And, and thank you, uh, Councillor uh, Wallace, for bringing this forward in the committee. And as uh, you know, a chair or co-chair of the committee, I, I wholeheartedly support this and I think it's past due. Um, 
our society is switching over and, and changing to electric vehicles. And I know there's um, there's even apps out there when you're traveling distances uh, where you can find charging stations available to uh, to plan your trip so you can reach your your destination safely and, and economically. So there's uh, I think there's opportunities out there for some cost sharing or some uh, some funding available to provide charging stations um, as an infrastructure piece and then have the uh, the user pay model uh, adapted in there as well. So uh, right now I'm not sure if there's any other location in the city that has an electric uh, vehicle charging station except City Hall. And if it's uh, not available, then there's nothing in the or in the city. You would have to go into the into the township, uh, probably at Township Hall, in order to to, to get uh, a charge for your vehicle. So I think this is um, serving the greater uh, environment, uh, the greater good of the of the region, as well as uh, our citizens as well. So I'm fully supportive of this. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Martin and then Councillor James. Yes, thank you. Um, I'd certainly be supportive of upgrading the, the uh, charging stations that we have now. Um, I would like to see though, before we do that, um, perhaps put them outside instead of in the underground parking lot or maybe put one in the underground parking lot and one outside. I agree with staff's comment that it's certainly the taxpayer that's picking up the price. Mr. Baumhoff, can you offhand give us the price of a charging station with installation, what the cost is? It, it, it ranges, it depends on, the, you know, if it's a fast charge, it's upwards of about 50,000, but um, I, and you know, costs do keep coming down. so. That's the purpose of doing the investigation, just to get the current cost. And for um, a, a slow charge or normal charge, I think it's more in the range of between, you know, up to 10,000. But I, I just need to get those numbers uh, more current so I can give you the accurate pricing before uh, moving forward with it. $50,000 is a lot of money for the taxpayers to subsidize. So would that include uh, the, the charging stations that you can charge people with, with, with a credit card? Or yes. are they more money again? No, that would be with the charging. And, and also that excludes any potential grant programs that either BC Hydro or the federal or provincial. So we would summarize that as well. Right. So I, I would agree that, that we should investigate um, the user pay electrical vehicle charging stations, um, along with perhaps, as I, I mentioned, putting one outside in the upper parking lot and one downstairs. I don't know our staff, whether any of our staff have electric vehicles. Um, is, is, there's not one in the staff parking, is there? There are, there are two in the staff area. Two in the staff and two in the public. So we got four machines down there. Okay. Yes. So along with that, um, how well used they are, uh, certainly in the staff, like do we need two or one? And would we charge staff to charge their cars? I mean, all those kind of things. It's, it's, um, <laughs> it's quite complex, I think, because you can't just say install it at, at a cost of $50,000. So I certainly look at um, a report coming back with those questions answered. And just to be clear, the ones in the staff area as well as the underground, those, those were not the $50,000 type. No. They were much uh, lower cost and um, they're more of a trickle charging uh, system. And the, the ones in the staff area were, were largely installed for um, the city electric vehicles. Okay. And, um, and then, of course, since then, some of the staff have purchased electric vehicles and have been using the charging stations as well. Right. But we can get all that information in a report. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Baumhoff. Okay, Councillor James. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, yeah, I think this is a great um, idea. I really appreciate the task group bringing this forward. I would I like would to like to. Sorry, I'm reverberating here. I would like to ask that included in the staff report, um, if this is supported by everyone, uh, where like the locations would be, because it says City Hall and then other places. So I don't know if that means two more or five more or 10 more. Um, <clears throat> I'd also be interested to know how often the technology changes on these. So if we make a you know, $50,000 investment in a charging station and a year later, the technology is um, changed because the electric vehicles change. Um, how prudent is that as far as the taxpayers? And the last thing, I guess, is um, I'd also be interested to know if people are actually paying their credit cards to use these charging stations in other communities. I suspect in places like larger communities they are. I just wonder if people would be like, heck with that, I can fill up for free at, you know, down the road or what have you, so or charge for free. So I think those are three questions that I would assume would be fairly relevant in whatever report comes back as well. But I do think it's a great idea to look into it for sure. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Um, I do have a comment for staff in the sense that um, when I was on the climate action committee with um, Metro Vancouver, they were looking at the superchargers and they already have a lot of that information with Transport 2050 and all the stuff they've been doing between Metro and TransLink, um, as well as UBCM and FCM. So um, I don't know, maybe we can get some information from them as well, Mr. Baumhoff. I'll do that. Yeah, I know they were looking at um, the superchargers uh, downstairs at Metro Tower 3 um, and 4. So um, if we can get that information, I think that would probably help us out a lot on costs and stuff. Sure. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else call the vote? All those in favor of the uh, first motion. Any opposed? That carries. Wonderful. Okay. Second motion is that council request staff to include a budget in 2022 to retain a consultant to complete a streetscape and park waste audit and provide options to improve waste diversions. So I have um, Councillor Wallace um, moving that and Councillor Albrecht seconding that again. And Councillor Sturdivant going to go ahead for discussion. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And thank you again, Councillor Wallace and Councillor Albrecht for that report. I guess the doggy do component is kind of a diversion issue. So um, we don't really have to separate that out. I can say though that I think the bins that we've been using um, are great. Unfortunately, um, I think they could be labeled better. I think the general public would like to um, do recycling. Um, and of course, there'll always be some who just don't get it right. But uh, I think that uh, the existing um, stainless steel that we have, uh, they're pretty good and they've really stood the test of time. I like the advertising income and I just wonder if the labeling could be improved. Um, I think there's always room for improvement. If, uh, if you want to change them all out, that's fine, but I, I just don't want it to cost us a lot of money. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Wallace. Um, through the mayor, um, to Mr. Sertaboom, we, we did, uh, actually that we had a lengthy conversation <laughs> And sometimes, I mean, I'm I'm really thrilled with our task group. They they are very task oriented, and a lot of these things come from our task group. Um, the thing is that there's 71 of them, and 71 uh, of those containers, and everything is going to the landfill. So they're they're basically they're useless aside from the advertising that's happening. So we're we're a task group that ha ha has been you know, assigned to, you know, different tasks and waste management is one of those. And how, how are we moving forward with waste management, um, you know, for the future? And, and yeah, labeling was one of the things that came up, but, um, you know, how, what does that look like when it comes to labeling? We have a few different um, waste garbage streams in the city. We have the two black uh, garbages with one is, you know, one is waste and then one is recycling. I don't know what, we haven't even looked at that. We have um, events that happen, well, they haven't been happening because of COVID, but uh, 
you know, we don't, I don't think we have, um, and it was noted, um, a good streaming when it comes to events as far as um, waste management goes. So in, I think it's just something that we, we have to investigate further and, and the contract that we have right now. Um, and yeah, so those were, there was a lot of questions and concerns that were raised. As far as the dog waste, that is something that is in our terms of reference of, or our tasks that we wanted to address. So that's something that is not going to go away. And um, I think that will be something that we, you know, bring forward as, as the same with um, single use plastic is another one and, and plastic bags. So there's a lot of things that um, the task group is looking at when it comes to recycling and waste management. And how do we move forward when we have 71 bins that are not doing that job, right? So, I mean, there's the education part and then there's a waste, you know, actually being productive when it comes to waste management and things not ending up in the, the landfill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Wallace. Just to follow up, if I may, Madam Mayor, um, I, I appreciate your response. And I really appreciate the hard work that the environmental task group is doing. Um, I can't help but wonder if when all of this is collected and it goes to uh, one uh, location, if that is uh, a single stream recycling, if uh, you know some of these recyclables are picked out, like I, I've been to the Amterra site over on 64th Avenue and I see they do it by hand. I can't help but wonder, is that where it goes? And if we don't know for sure, maybe we could check that out and include that in the report moving forward. Thank you again for your report. Thank you, Madam Mayor. If I could just uh, just uh, address that one, I think it's cross-contamination. So uh, I'll ask Mr. Baumhoff if he could maybe um, talk about that one as far as you can't really um, recycle when, when things are cross-contaminated. So if you could help with that one, Mr. Baumhoff. Certainly, I, I, we will definitely look into that uh, issue and, and ensure when we do our report that we address where the waste is currently going and if there's any recycling that is occurring but my my suspicion is that it's not but uh, we certainly will investigate and make sure that we we have that answer to that thank you again councillor pahal thank you madam mayor and uh just some general thoughts uh I think Metro Vancouver Regional District has done a lot of research on the topic of street side waste. And it is a tricky one because cross-contamination is so high. And this has been, I think, an ongoing struggle in our region. So in some regards too, I would be even happy if we were more honest with the labeling as well. So if it is garbage and contamination is high, let's just call it that because I know in the past, I would put, you know, the packing from like, you know, you go to the packing depot or the UPS store or whatever, and you just put it in there thinking, oh yeah, it's going to be recycled, but I could have actually just as easily brought it home. Uh, and now I do because I know that it ends up in the garbage. So, or things like bottles where, you know, I would think that it would be sent to the bottle depot, but knowing that it's not, I'll just take it home with me. Uh, so I think that's one of the things that we should look at with this report. Uh, I'm also, maybe, maybe I'm the person who is different than the rest of council, but the current bins are something that I don't believe contribute to the public realm and the streetscape in our downtown. And I would be happy if this report does look at, you know, could we move towards our actual public realm standard? Because it's, I find that the advertising is not used. It's usually just advertising, please advertise here. Uh, I do still notice the bins are all, they'll get open because I know there are some people that do. Um, there are binners that use the things to get the bottles, which is a good thing. And yeah, they just clutter up the sidewalk and create a nuisance. So I'm glad that we're putting this forward. I'm fully supportive of it. And you know, if it takes some time before we can get to a system where we can fully recycle, let's just be honest and call it what it is, garbage. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Councillor Albrecht. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And again, thank you, Councillor Wallace, uh, for your work and the, and the committees as well. And yeah, I, I agree with uh, the previous speakers. Uh, um, 
the uh, the general public, I believe, wants to do the right thing with recycling. Our current system, I believe, is failing, and the bins uh, have um, met their shelf life and, and uh, are not as effective in the separating and sorting to make effective recycling in our community. So. Uh, we know that this is not going to happen overnight. We know that this is going to be uh, a venture that is potentially costly. But I think, uh, like like uh, Councillor Wallace was saying, our current contract runs until 2026. We can give notice to end it earlier than that. But we do have some time to do the proper planning, to do the proper research, to try to get something that fits with our public realm uh, that will be effective in terms of, uh, uh, of proper recycling. And I think it's important to us as local government officials to, to lead the way and champion the correct way and uh, let's say a clear, um, not confusing uh, way of uh, recycling materials in our community. So um, I'm supportive of this. Um, it's not something that is going to happen overnight. This is probably something that is going to take a couple of years to implement. And, and uh, I think it's well worth our while and, and is, the timing is right for us to reevaluate how we do the business of recycling our materials in our community. So, yeah, I'm supportive of this and I'm hopeful most the majority of council will be as well. Great, thank you. Uh, Councillor James and then Councillor Martin. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, yeah, I don't wanna be a broken record, but I dislike those bins profusely. There is no advertising income from them whatsoever. As a matter of fact, that's the trade-off. They supply the bins, but they get all the advertising income. Um, there's no regulation of what's advertised, not to say that it's poor advertising, but there's advertising downtown for businesses in Surrey and all kinds of stuff. So there's no regulation at all, as far as I can see. And yeah, they're constantly broken into. So I'm going to support this um, primarily on the fact that I believe that they do not contribute to the public realm. But unfortunately, the very nature of waste is this. You can have 99 people that adhere to the rules. It takes one person to throw something and then the whole works is contaminated. So <clears throat> the education piece is tricky because unless you've got somebody literally standing at every single one saying you got to put it here and you got to put it there. So that is something that I think is going to be a challenge, but I genuinely believe that uh, the task group is, is up for it because it, they seem quite tenacious and they know what they're doing. So um, the only other thing I'm going to comment on is rather than looking at um, like a company that like I, sorry, I'm not even wording this correctly. I think there's companies out there, waste management companies that do sort despite contamination. So that might be something that we need to look into because that might be one of the solutions. Um, they'll probably be more expensive, but it's worth looking into. And the last comment is just, um, I think there's too many of them. I think 71 is overkill. Um, I know when they first installed them and they, they did that because they wanted the advertising revenue, <clears throat> excuse me, but I can recall having a conversation with engineering at the time saying like, we do not need two bins on every single corner. So they do over bin a little bit. And that's why I, I believe it's the advertising revenue. And if anybody's been to the dog off leash parks and gotten anywhere near the garbage cans with the dog waste in them, I don't think anywhere residential or otherwise is a good fit for adding a, a dog waste component unless there's an absolute guarantee that the odor won't be offensive. So that is my two cents on that. And thank you for bringing this forward, Councillor Wallace. I think it's a, a really appropriate time to look into this. Great, thank you. Councillor Martin. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I just wanna understand, um, it, it appears that uh, we, we have these containers and they're separated. Um, I think the containers work it appears to me what's not working is the pickup. Unless they're picked up individually, um, there's gonna be cross-contamination. So uh, I, I don't, you know, it was mentioned that, that our bins aren't working. Well, they are working. It sounds to me like it's the pickup that's not working. 
Um, I'm not sure that the, the motion that, that is before us that we include in the 22, 2022 budget, a consultant, um, I, I, I go back to Councillor Pakal's uh, comment about our streetscape plan. Uh, do we need to hire a consultant? We have, we have a streetscape plan. Don't we just follow that? Do we need to pay at a consultant fifty or hundred thousand dollars to come in and tell us where to put a garbage can? So I'm going to vote against this motion, but I I think that the whole system has to be relooked at and how how efficient it is. Most takeout restaurants now they all have the separated uh, cubicles to to get rid of your waste. I know a lot of people stand there and they wonder where they're gonna put it. Now, what they do with it afterwards, we, we don't know. We hope that the recycling goes to the recycling and the garbage goes to the garbage and the food waste goes to food waste, but we don't know. So uh, it does have to be looked at. Uh, I, I don't think that we need to hire a consultant as uh, was, was pointed out, this goes to 2026. So we do have a lot of time to, to look at this. Thank you. Councillor Wallace, go ahead. To the mayor, thank you. Um, to Councillor Martin, I don't think they are working. I, I think that, that it, the reason it came to um, the task group is because it's not working. And, I, and I've, seen, I've seen them pick, pick them up and I've asked the, the guy who picks them up, so what happens? And he, t he told me, yes, they get, it's cross-contaminated and it all ends up in the same thing. Uh, I think for the most part, people are conscientious of wanting to do the right thing. And I think I think that having 71, and I don't want to go on and on about it, but by having 71 and, and them not working, I don't think it's um, it's not sending the right message to the community. Um, and when it comes to waste management, I I you know, we talk about the costs of waste management. It'd be nice to get some support when it comes to waste management because we're not just talking about recycling materials where, you know, we're talking about food waste and, and so on. So I know there's a lot of education done through Metro Vancouver um, that we can, you know, gain some of that resources or take from, from them. Um, I think it's something that we have to move forward and investigate, but I think waiting till 2026 to be proactive when it comes, comes to waste management is too long because we've already waited already too long. So um, and when it comes to restaurants and takeout containers, a lot of takeout containers end up in those in those garbage cans. So yeah, um, I'm just looking forward to seeing what staff come back with and moving forward in a, in a productive way. So, so can I just, just respond to that if, if, if I may? Um, I'm not on mute. I think no matter what container we have, there's gonna be cross-contamination. Uh, I know Metro Vancouver does a study every year. They, they actually go to the, the depots and they have people go through the garbage and they do an audit of, of what, uh, what is thrown away and cross-contamination. And I can get that information. I am on the Solid Waste Committee at Metro Vancouver. Um, I do think that it has to be looked at. What I don't think we need to do at this point in time, I think staff and perhaps Mr. Baumhoff can comment on this, can come back with some kind of a report instead of us looking to put something in the, in the budget next year. Um, you know, even that is it's another year. Uh, why can't we get some kind of a staff report and perhaps look into uh, what it would cost us to get out of this contract now. I'm not saying that these are the, the be all and end all, but whatever we have, there is going to be cross contamination. Thank you. Um, I just have a question from staff. I know um, Mr. Baumhoff, several years ago, we had the third highest tonnage of garbage in Metro Vancouver. And I remember um, one of the news agencies contacting us on that. It was either 2018 or 2019. 
So I'm wondering where we stand now on that in the metro region. Do you do you have any ideas where we stand in those numbers now? I I don't have that. I, I do recall vaguely that there was um, some statistics that were reported on that my I recollection. I don't remember was, the figures exactly, but yeah, there it's was a some concern. inaccuracy inaccuracy in those statistics as well. And, and just you know what's included and what's not, and but um, that is a, that would be overall garbage versus just the streetscape containers. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily speak to this particular issue here, but. Yeah, just, just curious, that's all. Um, but we can, I, I can certainly um, do the investigation as to, that wouldn't be difficult to find out what it would cost to get out of the current contract. And, um, and I could also, provide some cost stats and based on the township numbers and they they're just converting over to to their own bins as well and and with better descriptions and advertising of the what's allowed in the containers um, I have the pricing for those containers so we can you know if we wanted to exit out of the contract and just rough numbers as to what it would cost if we wanted to buy our own bins and do the proper signage, et cetera, uh, I could definitely do that sooner than what, what the consultant report was really related to was doing a full you know, waste audit, assessing the contamination levels and, uh, you know, and also I think reviewing other municipalities where they have containers uh, that are better advertising what their contamination levels are and what's a realistic goal for us to achieve. Because as, as has been stated, it's tricky. You know, it, it's, it, it, people might have the will, good will to do the right thing, but all it takes is some people to not care and they put it into the containers and it's contaminated. Um, now, if it's a minor amount of contamination, it's not that serious of an issue. It's, it's more when it's significant and as you know, Metro Vancouver has banned certain materials out of the waste stream. So we just, we just have to be cautious of, uh, you know, ensuring we meet those requirements. Great, thank you. Mr. Chung, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I think the recommendations to include a budget, a line budget item in 2022 is fine given that, you know, Mr. Baumhoff is gonna do uh, some investigation early on. And really the budget needs to be approved by council in the 2022 budget del deliberation process. So I think it's fine to include this recommendation or uh, to approve this recommendations tonight because uh, council still have a chance later on, depending on what Mr. Baumhoff finds out uh, later on in the year to decide whether we would pursue this line budget item in the 2022 budget. Thank you. Great, thanks for that clarification, Mr. Chung. Uh, Councillor Albrecht. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor, and, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chung. That, that's kind of what I was gonna say, was that this, this allows staff to do a proper uh, report and possible options. And it also uh, you know, gives them the authority that if they feel that a consultant is required in order to do this complete evaluation, it, it, it allows that to be included in, and as uh, Mr. Chung says, it's going to all it's all going to come back to council for further debate and further discussion and further review and and how this is going to look and how it moves forward. So, um, what we want to do is uh, have enough um, say flexibility built into the recommendation that it can empower staff to do a a proper evaluation and report to come back to council for for a little more meaningful dialogue. So thank you. Okay, uh, any other further discussion on this? I'll call the vote. All those in favor, any opposed? Okay, that carries. Okay, so on to new and unfinished business. Uh, Center for Equitable Library Access, 
CELA and the National Network for Equitable Library Services and NELS funding. Councillor Martin, go ahead. I'm sorry, uh, I was looking at a, a Metro Vancouver solid waste report. Um, so what do you want me to do? I'm sorry. It's your motion is that, did you The motion on Sela? Okay, let me just get it here. So there, there is uh, the motion, basically, uh, there is a lot of background uh, in, right in the motion, but I, I will read it out. Uh, whereas the Fraser Valley Regional Library and almost all libraries in Canada currently provide specialized services for the visually impaired and print disabled through the Center for Equitable Library Access, which is CELA for short, and the National Network for Equitable Library Services, NELS for short, and whereas both agencies are engaged in accessible book production and collectively receive $4 million in annual federal funding to support this needed service. And whereas the federal government has announced that they are restoring the 2021 funding cut to these services previously announced in the 2020 fall economic statement, but have not committed to providing sustainable funding for these services past 2021. Therefore, be it resolved that Langley City send letters to the Minister of Employment, Workforce Development, and Disability Inclusion, the Honorable Carla Qualtro, the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, the Honorable Christopher Freeland, and our local members of Parliament requesting sustainable funding for CELA and NELS to support the continued production of accessible reading materials, and I would so move. Okay, you literally all three of you raised your hand at exactly the same time. And I'm gonna go with Councillor Albrecht because he's at the top of my screen and that's kind of who I saw first. So, um, okay, Councillor Pahal, did you have? Yes, thank you, Madam <laughs> Mayor. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I fully support Councillor Martin's motion. Thank you for bringing this forward. It's so imperative that we have equitable access to library resources. So yeah, you have my full support. Thank you for bringing this forward. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Councillor Wallace. Yeah, I too want to the mayor, I wanna thank uh, Councillor Martin, such an important um, issue to bring forward. So thank you for bringing this forward. I'm in full support. Councillor Albrecht? Yeah, uh, again, I'll just echo the same that I want to thank Councillor Martin for bringing this forward. And and quite quite frankly, <laughs> uh, I guess I would view that if uh, if they don't sustain the funding for this, it's it's a form of discrimination. And uh, it's, it'd be shameful for them to not continue on with supporting such a important component of uh, providing access to learning and education and bettering the lives of those that really could use it. So I, this has got my total support. Thank you. I'm upset at better myself. Very well said. Thank you. So if I, if I may just comment, not at Madam Mayor, thank you everyone for your, your support. Um, when I originally uh, gave this motion to staff, it, it was, it read a bit different because at that time, all we knew was that they were gonna be cutting a million dollars a year for the next four years, which was gonna wipe out the funding. And then I heard late, I think on Thursday night that they had restored the $1 million for 2021, um, which brings it back up to four, 4 million. But you know, if you look at the federal budget, I have no idea how many millions of dollars is in the federal budget. $4 million is not a lot of money. And, and I agree, I mean, these, it allows access for, for people with uh, the reading and uh, print disabilities. So I, I thank you all for your support. And um, if staff could, well, there's, there's no, when I first brought the motion forward, it was urgent that we get the letter out the next day, but now uh, we'll look forward to staff composing this uh, in the next little while, thank you. Okay, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Uh, opposed? Nobody's opposed to that. <laughs> okay.
Okay, that carries. On to correspondence. Uh, prohibition of no pets policy. We received a message from Mr. Stephen Neff. And what is council's wishes with that? Receive for information. And a seconder on that. Okay, all those in favor. Those Madam, Mayor. Madam Mayor. I tried to put up my hand. Yep. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. You'd been doing so well with the other hand. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so this letter was in our correspondence uh, last week, and I read with, with interest um, Mr. Neff's letter and couldn't uh, agree with him more. Uh, as was stated uh, by Jane Nielsen this morning or this afternoon, uh, people during this pandemic were going crazy trying to adopt animals. And I think a lot of it was to, you know, they're, they're lonely, they need something. Now, I don't know if the, Vancouver has done this, that they've not allowed, uh, no, I, they've, there's no pet policy. Um, they haven't allowed that in rental buildings in Vancouver. And I don't know because it's under the Vancouver Charter if they can do that or whether we can do that as a community in, under the community charter. Uh, I wish we could do it for stratas too because a lot of stratas. But if you look on Facebook, when people are looking for places to rent, I would say in 90% of the cases, they're saying pet friendly and they're very hard to come by. So what I'm requesting at this time is that if we could get a staff report on whether we're able to bring in this kind of a policy for the city um, and you know what the ramifications may be. So I, I would like to move that staff um, prepare a report on uh, a no pet policy uh, for, for Langley City in rentals. I'm assuming while well, you're seconding that. Okay, and what would you like to say to that? Go ahead. I think Councillor uh, Councillor Martin spoke <laughs> well and uh, addressed a, a lot of what I wanted to say. And uh, this gentleman did come to me um, a while ago. So um, he's presented it to all of council and I, I'm glad that he did. And I think I, I would agree, I would send it back to for staff to investigate moving forward. Okay, any further discussion on that? I'll call the, oh, go ahead, Councillor James. Sorry, late to the party here. Um, so are we talking about no pet policy across the board or special needs dogs? Like, or, or, or special needs pets? Are like no, people that need them, like companion dogs and seeing eye dogs and things like that? Or is this like right across the board? It's across the board and it's in, in rental apartments that currently don't allow pets. Okay. So the, the policy would be that pets are allowed in all rentals in Langley City. Okay, thank you. So we're just having staff investigate that possibility. Yeah. So just yeah. staff looking into it. Okay, anyone? Okay, so now I'm gonna call the vote. <laughs> all those in favor of having staff that can do it. And that carries, okay. Uh, next up on correspondence is support for laid off hotel and tourism industry workers. Uh, City of New West, what is council's wishes with this? Councillor Albrecht? Yeah, I'd like to refer this to staff for a, a follow up report. I'll second it, but I'll give it to Councillor Wallace because she's nodding her head and saying yes. Is that correct? Did you want to speak to it as well, Councillor Wallace? Uh, I'm just um, glad that New Westminster brought it forward and referring it to staff. It's like, oh my goodness, I'm like, when I'm wondering how staff does it when they get so many things referred to them. But uh, this, this is a, a really important um, issue, especially when it comes to the equity piece and people losing their jobs and being in that sector for such a long time and not being able to go back to it. So um, just on that, you know, equity piece alone, I'm, I'm glad that it's being referred to staff. Uh, Mr. Chen. 
Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. I think if council is supportive of this motion from the city of New West, council could actually pass a motion to support this and uh, send this uh, a support back to uh, the province. And, um, so that will short circuit uh, referring back to staff. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Albrecht, would you like to change that motion? Yeah, I'll take that motion and then put Instead. that forward. Okay, yeah. <laughs> thank you. And Councilor Wallace will second that. <laughs> Perfect, Councilor Albrecht. Yeah, I just, I just really want to reinforce that uh, this is a segment of our workforce that is, that is really, really feeling the pains of COVID. And one of our biggest employers here in the city is, is uh, the Cascades Casino and the hotel. Uh, and we have a number of hotels that, uh, that also uh, provide uh, employment for workers here in, in the city. So I think this is a very important thing to recognize and support. So thank you very much. All right, okay, call the vote on that. All those in favor, sending a letter that carries. Uh, next one is um, disability and income assistance to a livable rate response from Minister Simons from Langley City when we sent the letter. So motion for receipt of the correspondence from Minister uh, Simons. Yeah. First and Senator, all those in favor, okay, receive the information. Uh, request endorsement to the province for the Help Cities Lead campaign from the City of Victoria. Uh, Councillor Pahal, go ahead. Uh, could I make a motion that staff reach out to this organization so that we can receive a presentation? There seems to be, I'll just leave it there and then I can talk to it. I'll second that. Councillor uh, Wallace, yep, go ahead. Councilor yeah, and Paul. just through the mayor, uh, I just want to get more information on this. Uh, it seems to align with the motion that council passed a month or two ago around GHG, so. Thank you. Great, thanks. Any further discussion on that? Okay, seeing none, call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, good stuff. Uh, Councillor Albrecht, you were up next. Okay, so um, in previous correspondence, I think it was last week's correspondence package for council, there was a letter from the office of the mayor, George Harvey in Delta. And uh, this is a really, really important um, uh, topic in, in BC and it's medical, medical care for our residents and uh, all residents in BC. And what we have right now is a broken system. Uh, the BC Ambulance Service and the firefighters um, are under two different jurisdictions. Our, our firefighters are paid for by taxpayer money. The BC Ambulance Service is provided by the province and is paid for by the province. Uh, and um, this, this letter, while I understand and believe its um, uh, intention to provide the best level of medical service to residents uh, during these tough times, which is you know unequivocal, it, that needs to happen. And I do support completely uh, firefighters, uh, first responders, BC Ambulance Service, uh, I think they do a phenomenal job. But what we've got here is a, um, a downloading of, of costs and services to local governments by our provincial government not providing the proper staffing and funding for our ambulance services. Yeah. So we've been fighting this, this battle for probably over 10 years to try to get uh, a model that works more effectively and get the proper funding back to our local coffers to help up, help upset the um, the cost for our firefighters being called out to medical services. So uh, there's many of the things that our firefighter service could be providing for our community in a proactive measure to, to uh, ensure that we don't have any uh, devastating fires in our community and we've had a few over the years and not that to say that that might have been prevented but it may have been prevented if they could be more proactive so um, my concern is that um, there's a number of mayors that have signed this thing in our in, in the lower mainland that are encouraging and, and 
potentially supporting the downloading of uh, BC ambulance services and their provincial dollars onto local government. And that's not fair to our taxpayers and our tax rates. So um, I had some real concerns. And when I saw this in the package, I was somewhat surprised that, um, that we had um, offered our support in this when it's a little bit contrary to the messaging that, uh, that we've been sending to the province. So um, I would have liked to have uh, had a conversation about this at the council table about providing uh, some uh, additional support, but probably some additional wording uh, to get some funding from the province and a commitment from the province to sit down and try to have a, a model that works effectively for all British Columbians. There are some firefighters or some communities where their firefighters are all volunteer. They have very little paid call. So ambulance services is very critical to them. So we can't just um, have a, uh, an urban flavor to this, this huge issue in all of BC. So um, yeah, this, this is something that, that did concern me and I wanted to bring it up. Um, the letter is signed and it's sent, but uh, it's, it's a disappointment that we didn't get a chance to have that conversation at the council table with other members of council. So I just felt strongly about bringing that forward. And I'm not looking for, I guess, any action at this time, but it might be nice to hear from your worship about um, how that all came about and the thought processes behind uh, the, the city endorsing something that we haven't necessarily endorsed over the past 10 years so yep i'm going to let councillor martin go first thank you yeah uh councillor albrecht's right uh, we have uh, been trying to change this system for the past 10 years and i know myself uh at least I know once, maybe twice, we've met with ministers in the past at the UBCM requesting uh, funding for our first responders uh, to go to calls. So, and, the, and, uh, and I've always been turned down. And, and I like, like uh, Councillor Albrecht, when I saw this letter in the package, I, I was surprised because we have not supported what they are requesting. And I guess I was also surprised that it was never discussed with council. It was just arbitrarily signed um, in, with the city supporting it. So, um, you know, I know Councillor Albrecht, you said that you'd like to have a meeting perhaps with the ministers. We can try again, but I have to say we've tried on several occasions um, over the years to, to have this uh, change and, and it hasn't worked. But I will we'll now listen to the explanation from the mayor. Thank you. Did anybody else want to make any comments before I? Okay, so we are in a pandemic with COVID. And as you guys all stated, we've been trying for years to talk to the government and haven't gotten any uh, leeway. What this was letter was intended to do was to support Delta in getting a conversation started with the government about paramedics and about firefighters, because us going through UBCM hasn't been working. So this was a great way to get the government to listen to us that some communities need fire trucks, some need paramedics. We need paramedics. Our paramedics are um, dropping a dime by the dozen. And this letter, um, I thought would be okay to support to get more paramedics, which is what we've been asking for for the last 10 years. Our firemen do a great job. This wasn't anything against them. This was a matter of supporting communities that need that support. Um, when we have a great fire service, who is going to a heart attack down the road and is there within five minutes and saves someone. And you have a community right next to you that is waiting 45 minutes and people are dying from heart attacks because there aren't enough paramedics to show up. It's been all over the news. 
Um, so I thought this was a great conversation starter with the province to say that, yeah, we are all different. You haven't been listening to us at UBCM and we need to have these discussions because we need more paramedics trained. And with COVID, with PTSD, it's just gonna get worse for everybody in protective services. So we need to start having these conversations and we need to actually, I think, form a committee for um, on UBCM or whatever it may be that we have these open talks and discussions. Go ahead, Councillor Alba. Thank, thank you for that, Madam Mayor, and thanks for the clarification. Um, I, uh, I still like, the, the letter that, that um, Mayor Harvey is writing isn't really asking for any, any additional ambulance service or paramedics, but saying that, uh, I'm not gonna get into a debate on that, but maybe, maybe we should be forming our own letter to send off to the minister and uh, other jurisdictions about uh, a proper funding formula and in an agreement uh, that uh, is like real world that's really going to work in our communities because it's broken right now and, and it's 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 um it's failing so miserably uh that we're burning out staff because the staffing levels aren't right with our with our ambulance service uh i said like again i this isn't about not supporting firefighters or ambulances this is about supporting the whole system so that we get the proper care for our for our residents. If I'm having a heart attack, I want the first available person to me as soon as possible. So that's that's the key and most important topic. If it's firefighters, great. If it's ambulance service, wonderful. But we're not talking about um, a fair and equitable arrangement right now when we have a provincial government that provides the service and the monies for that service, and it's been stripped down so badly previously that it it hasn't it's it's almost impossible to restore. At least that's the indications I'm getting. So to download onto uh, local governments is not right. And I think maybe what we need to do is is maybe clarify the city's position on what we want to achieve uh, at the end of the day and um, not uh, not fall in line with uh, uh, Mayor Harvey and what his community wants, because as you said, every community is different. And I think we should be adding some additional clarification, maybe. I don't know, I just throw that out there as an idea if someone wants to make that motion. So I would that's love, all I have at this point. I would love more clarification because if we can get more paramedics and get protective services the help they want, that's exactly what we want. And you know what, quite honestly, this letter blew out on the news and now the province is finally talking to us. So whether the letter was good or bad, we're starting, we've started the conversations now. They know that our paramedics, we're not gonna stand for it anymore. So whether you support it or not, I, I think it was, it was a, good, a good thing and I think we can do more. And I, and I hope we do do more. Councillor Storboom. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you for the conversation around this subject. Uh, yeah, I, I read the letter, I got a different take. Uh, uh, I, I see this as almost like a, a social injustice. The paramedics have been uh, badly treated for a good long time, and uh, they deserve to be more respected. They deserve to have their numbers increased. Uh, they do an amazing job. And, and quite honestly, it, it is part of the provincial health care mandate to serve the general public through the paramedic service. And I think that we've just opened up the door for the province to say, oh, you mean we could download some more? Well, we'll just do that then. Whether or not the conversation actually goes that way remains to be seen. But quite honestly, the fire service was never really intended to be a medical emergency service. We've been taking that on and adding to it. Now we have a rescue truck and the province is gonna keep pushing on that because it's a hot button that means money for their budget downloading to the municipalities has uh, become uh, increasingly difficult for our budgets to deal with and i think that this is a conversation we need to have and maybe this letter is an opportunity for us to start that conversation moving in a different direction from how i read that letter 
So thank you very much for the conversation and I will support the initiative of sending a letter to clarify our position to the minister. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Pahal and then Councillor Martin. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And yeah, I know that okay. in Delta, they're looking at a model of fire EMS and that might be different than Langley City where we've been asking for increased uh, funding from paramedical services. Uh, through the BC Ambulance Service or BC Emergency Health Services, I guess is what they're called now. So I think to move this conversation forward, uh, I'll just put a motion forward that staff prepare a discussion paper on paramedical services in Langley City, because I believe that's the best way we can move forward. Uh, I'll just see if anyone wants to second that or, or not. I'll second that. So uh, I'll also continue. And like Councillor Martin said, I've been in the meetings with the uh, Minister of Health. And I know that they said point blank to us, uh, if you want to increase the level of service for your residents, you can pay for it. And I, I don't think that's fair or right. So uh, I think by having this discussion paper, at least we can get everything on the table and then we can have a actual policy that is council endorsed, so. Thank you, uh, Councillor Martin. Thank you. Unfortunately, I don't have the letter in front of me. I don't recall it asking for more paramedics. But if I may, could we ask Mr. Chung exactly to state what our position has been over the last several years? Yeah, through the, the mayor to Council Martin, our position has been that uh, we would like the province to provide uh, adequate and appropriate uh, paramedic services to the citizens of this community. Our MESA calls, has been in the range of about 75 to 80% over the past few years, with the exception of this past year because of COVID. And we are struggling to actually be able to uh, go to all those medical calls. And we have been asking the province over a number of years, uh, either to change the model as number of counselors uh, commented tonight, or if you want us to take on those medical calls, then yes. we want a cost recovery model yeah. for such. So that has been our position over the last number of years. And uh, so we'll be happy to provide a, a discussion paper to council for further discussion with the province. Thank you, Mr. Chang. Thank you. Councillor Sturdivant, was that, okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And thank you for those comments. I appreciate Councillor Pahal's motion and I will support it, but I'd like to ask if we could have a fairly quick look at a discussion paper because it's my understanding that this conversation is taking place right now. And I'd really like to be there for that instead of waiting for a discussion paper and arriving at the conversation after the fact. Thank you very much. I'm going to let Councillor James go first because she hasn't spoken yet. Councillor Paul, and then I'll get your reaction after. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, my question, I guess, is, is to you, if that's okay. Um, just seems to me that the decision of this significance should have been run by your council. And I'm just curious why you arbitrarily signed that letter without consultation, which essentially changed the trajectory of what we've been fighting for since 2014. It actually didn't change the trajectory. And if you'd like to discuss it with me, I'd be more than happy if you contact me in my office or actually email me for once and talk to me on the slide. Putting me in front, uh, calling me out like this in front of public, I don't think is acceptable. Um, you know, any one of you could have contacted me before if you had concerns, which you didn't. You went to Mr. Chung. Um, who is in charge of staff. So you continuously put him in the middle of uh, items when you could come to me. Point of order, Madam Mayor, point of order. That has nothing to do with this and I did not run to Mr. Chung. I will send you an email asking you this question. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, I appreciate that. Go ahead, Councillor Pahal. Uh, I'm just gonna follow up to Councillor Stortaboom's comments. I believe we do have a discussion paper that uh, Mr. Chung can send to us quick. So and uh, we can make that determination and make sure that we're all uh, aligned and that it's a consistent message that we're bringing forward for Langley City. Is that fair, uh, Mr. Chung? Do we have that information? I feel like we've presented that to UBCM in the past. So. 
Uh, through the mayor to council for call, yes, we do have a, a number of documentations that we have presented to uh, the premiers and also the ministers of the day, uh, as well as um, at the UBCM. And we, there is also Auditor General report that was completed about a couple of years ago that sort of speak to this issue. So we can gather those information up and uh, I, will, I will work with our chief and to bring that information back to council as quickly as possible. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Councillor Albrecht, you've spoken a couple of times, correct? I'm going to call the vote. Unless you have some new information to present. Uh, no, I, I was just going to say that, and we can discuss this when the report comes about uh, the circulation of it, because I would like these other communities to know our position as well. Yeah, I agree 100%. And again, if an email would have gone out with the correct information, I think that would have been beneficial as well. So, um, yeah, I'm going to throw that out there. So, okay, I'm going to call the vote. All those in favor? Can, can I? Can we just have the motion? Want a point of order? No, no, I want motion read. What the motion is? Oh, exactly. go ahead, Mr. Or Councillor Pahal. Yeah, through the mayor, that staff prepare a discussion paper on paramedical services in Langley City. Thank you. Okay, all those in favor, that carries. And we're done with that. Okay, that was at the end. Sorry, I need to go back to my paperwork here. All right, we're going on to new business. Motion to hold the closed meeting. Staff had indicated that one of the reasons for closing the meeting was not included in the recommendation on the agenda in error and therefore asked that subsection E of section 90 of the community charter be included in the resolution as a reason to hold a closed meeting, that being the acquisition, acquisition disposition and expropriation of land or improvements if the council considers the disclosure could reasonably be expected to harm the interest of the municipality. So the motion is that the council meeting immediately following this meeting be closed to the public as the subject matter being considered relates to items which comply with the following closed meeting criteria specified in section 90 of the community charter. One, a part of a council meeting may be closed to the public if the subject matter being considered relates to or is one or more of the following. C, labor relations and other employee relations. G, litigation or potential litigation affecting the municipality. E, the acquisition, disposition or expropriation of land or improvements. If the council considers that disclosure could reasonably be expected to harm the interests of the municipality. So I need a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Stortaboom. Councillor Martin, all those in favor, that carries. Okay, we are going into a closed meeting. So I was gonna say thank you to the public, but we don't have anybody from the public here. So motion that the meeting adjourn. I need a mover and a seconder. Councillor Stortaboom, Councillor Albrecht, all those in favor. And that carries.